Hello everybody, welcome to the second part of my UAC training video. The user account control is the subject of this part two video. The first portion or the first part of this video series, I showed you and demonstrated to you the settings found on the UAC slider off of control panel and the user's control panel applet. I said to you that that slider is only meant for the user that is in there configuring that slider. I said that the settings that you configure there will only affect your account and they will not affect anybody else that happens to log on to that particular machine. So what do we do if we need to make broad sweeping changes to the user account control mechanism so that it affects everybody that logs on to a particular machine or everybody that happens to be in an OU or a domain out there through group policy? Well, we would configure the local security policy settings on the local machine to protect all users of the local machine or we would pass down similar settings in group policy to the domain or to the organizational unit and affect everybody in the enterprise who is a member of that OU or of that domain. We're going to demonstrate this for you here in the local security policy. Now first off, what is UAC? I really didn't get into that in the first video but the UAC user account control does exactly what it says. It controls what your user account can do. We really only have two usable accounts in a Windows 7 environment or a Server 2008 environment or a Vista environment for that matter. An administrative type account and a standard user account. Yes, absolutely, we have a guest account, which is disabled. We have a local admin account on the box, which is also disabled. So functionally, we will use a standard user account when we log on to a Windows system uh, in any fashion. Now, I could be a member of the domain admins group in my enterprise, but when I log on to my Windows 7 machine to the domain, I am not given domain admin privileges. Why? UAC won't allow it. I am given my standard user credentials. So in essence, if I am a member of an administrative group and I log on, I am really issued what's known as a split access token. Half of my token contains the information needed to successfully log on as a standard user. The other half, known as the administrative portion, is in fact empty. Pretty cool. Now, that administrative portion of that token will in fact fill up with everything needed to access an administrative location, but UAC will do that for us after we go through a prompt to elevate our privileges. Now, if you think back to the Windows Vista operating system, as I mentioned in the first video, it was kind of crazy because everything you did, you got a prompt. Literally, moving your mouse or going into a Windows-based utility that shipped with the operating system, configuring something on the operating system itself caused prompt after prompt after prompt, and it drove all of the admin types out there crazy, including myself. Well, we all complained to Microsoft, and Microsoft was nice enough to make some changes. Microsoft made some changes by providing the slider that I demoed for you in part one. And also, there's a very big change that you will see in a few minutes here in the local security policy. So, the first type of setting that we're going to look at in the local security policy here is going to be the third one from the top. User account control, behavior of the elevation prompt for administrators in admin approval mode. Well, what does that mean? That means that my account is a member of an administrative group in some fashion, whether it's domain admins, enterprise admins, whatever admin group it is. This is the prompting, this is the configuration for the prompts, and ultimately the prompts that you're going to have to deal with. So how does this work? Real quick, let's take a look around the operating system for a minute because I think it's important to show you something. I'm going to right click on computer and I'm going to go to properties. Notice on the left hand side we have device manager, remote settings, system protection, advanced system settings and they have these yellow and blue shields next to those links. Over here is the change settings link for changing your computer name, joining a work group, joining a domain. Notice it also has a yellow and blue shield next to the link. 
If I click the Start button and go into Control Panel, I'll see several more next to User Accounts and Family Safety. If I go into the System and Security Control Panel applet, I'll see a whole bunch more listed in this location. Guys, this shield simply says that that location requires administrative privileges to enter it. So, if I weren't logging on as a member of an administrative group, meaning I'm a real standard user, and I go into that location, I would get a prompt. And that default prompt, which we'll see in a minute, would ask me for a username and a password of an administrative account to allow me in. I like to refer to this as help desk mode. Think about it for a minute. You get a call at the help desk, you venture out to the user's desk, we don't want to log off that user and then log back on as us to fix the problem. We can go into Device Manager or whatever, initiating that communication with the user's own account there. And then when the dialog box pops up for UAC, I can put my username and password in there and help the user fix their problem. The, the whole UAC mechanism is driven, for the most part, by prompts. So the first scenario here, we are a member of an administrative group. I've logged on to a system. Now, how will the prompts affect me when I attempt to do something that requires administrative privileges? Remember, I'm just a standard user, even though I'm an admin. So what would my prompt look like? Well, remember I said there's some welcome changes. The first one was that slider. The second one is what you're seeing right here. The prompt that would pop up for me would be a prompt for consent for non-Windows binaries. This is a beautiful thing. This simply means that if I am an admin and I'm going to a location in the operating system that is a part of Windows 7, meaning it's shipped with the operating system, it is considered a Windows binary, and I won't be prompted at all. Hallelujah. Back in the Vista world, guys, if I were to go into Device Manager or go into Remote Settings or System Protection, I would have to elevate my privileges. Well, guess what? Don't have to do it anymore. That was a direct answer to all the cries from all the system admins who said, please, don't prompt us so much. Now, if I choose this drop-down box, there's other options in here as well. I can say elevate without prompting, meaning, hey, just elevate me and let me in. I can say prompt for credentials on the secure desktop. That secures it even more. This brings it back to the Vista world, meaning you're going to have to put credentials in there. Yeah, I'm logged on as the admin, but I still need to reauthenticate with my credentials. It's actually a little bit stricter than the Vista uh, mechanism used to be. The next one down is prompt for consent on the secure desktop. That's very important. That was the actual Vista realm. I had to say, are you sure you wanted to go here? Yes, I do. Click OK, and it let me in. And notice the secure desktop designation there. I mentioned the secure desktop in the first part of this video series. I'll refresh your memory about it. The secure desktop is, you'll see it when your desktop goes dim when you ask for elevation. The dim desktop is not just a color change, as I mentioned. This is an actual security precaution. This is isolating the process that executed that prompt or created that prompt away from the explore.exe shell and the kernel of the operating system. So I mentioned a virus or a Trojan that attacks your machine. Let's say there's a time bomb virus that you got for some reason. It goes off at 4 o'clock a.m. in the morning. It attempts to turn your firewall off. UAC pops up, secure desktop kicks in. That virus is isolated from the rest of the operating system. I also mentioned to you in the first video that after 30 seconds, that uh, secure desktop goes away and that process is completely removed from memory and completely isolated. In essence, it kills the process. Well, prompting for consent on a secure desktop, that is the way it used to be. That secure desktop mechanism is extremely important. My recommendation to you is that you always use a secure desktop. As a matter of fact, I will show you the master toggle for that in a bit. We also have just prompt for credentials and prompt for consent with no designation of the secure desktop. Now notice, they don't say anything on any of these about Windows binaries. So that means no matter what, if I choose one of those options and I go to a Microsoft Windows related utility like Device Manager, I'm going to have to authenticate via giving consent or username and password based on whichever one I've chosen. The default is, again, <clears throat> prompt for consent for non-Windows binaries. Man, that's a welcome change. 
All right, I'm going to close that one for you. And now we're going to look at the next one in the list. This is the user account control behavior of the elevation prompt for standard users now. You're not in an admin group. You're regular old Joe logging on to your Windows 7 machine, 8.30 in the morning, getting ready to do your job. Now, what happens when you go to one of those locations protected by a shield? Notice the default setting here, prompt for credentials. This is what I call the help desk mode. You've only got two other options here. We can say automatically deny elevation requests, meaning, hey, you're denied. You're never allowed to go in anywhere or prompt for credentials on the secure desktop. I'm going to advise you switch it to this one because I love that secure desktop. Remember though what I said in the first video, the secure desktop may in fact break your applications, meaning if that secure desktop pops up while you have an application running, very, very rarely, but it happens, an application could lock up. So my advice is always test the secure desktop with all of the applications that you built into your image. If they all work fine with secure desktop, by all means, you should be using the secure desktop because it is going to help you drastically eradicating bad processes and viruses that may sneak by your antivirus software and attempt to do damage to your machine. All right, I'm going to drop this back to the default setting here. Let's take a look now at <clears throat> the next user-based rule, and that would be the first one in the list here. User account control admin approval mode for the built-in local administrative account. Guys, understand that the local admin account is disabled by default. Well, what happens if you enable it? Well, if I enable it, the local account basically bypasses UAC. Well, I may not want that. I might, for some reason, need that local account, <clears throat> but I want UAC to protect even the local admin. In essence, I'm going to treat the local admin as if it is just a member, meaning the account is just a member of a regular old administrative group. I'm going to put it in what's called admin approval mode. That simply means that if I log on with that local admin account and I go somewhere, I'm going to be prompted for consent on non-Windows binaries, like we talked about with the first one there. All right. Next. I'm going to show you the master toggle switch all the way down on the bottom, the second one from the bottom here. User account control, switch to the secure desktop when prompting for elevation. Remember what I said about a master switch for the secure desktop, this is it. If I enable this when necessary, the secure desktop will work irregardless of what the prompt choice that I made in the individual prompts. So this is the master toggle switch for that fantastic feature known as the secure desktop. Now, guys, the other half of UAC deals with applications. I want you to understand that users can't interact as administrators. Applications can also not act as an administrator on your system, meaning if an application requires administrative privileges to the registry, the program files group, system32 directory, or drivers folders, that application will not effectively run on the Windows 7 machine. Later on, I'm going to do a, a video on, vi on file and registry virtualization. I'll explain how that process works. But for right now, understand that UAC is going to protect your system against applications that require too many privileges. Remember, the registry, the program files group, the system32 folder, and the drivers folder are off limits, period. So let's take a look at some of those local security account settings in here as well for UAC. The first one I want to talk to you about is this one right here, user account control. Detect application installations and prompt for elevation. Now this is for a standard user who logs onto their system and they attempt to install an application that requires administrative privileges to set itself up properly on the Windows 7 system. If the administrative privilege is required, by default, a prompt is going to pop up and that user is going to have to go in there and put a username and a password of an administrator to allow that application to install. Now, if I disable it like it is right now, that does not mean a user can install anything they want. That means if it requires administrative privileges, it will not install, period. You won't get a prompt giving you the option to put a username and a password in there to install. 
Okay. Disabling it means the app will not install. Now, if you have an application that doesn't require admin kind of privileges, it doesn't require access to the registry, program file system 32, driver's folder, and so forth, not a problem. It's going to bypass this totally, and it will install correctly on the Windows system. We're only talking about applications seeking administrative access or privileges. Okay. We also have the next one down in the list here for applications, only elevate executables that are signed and validated. This is a great way to create a series of applications that any user can install. Why? Because we're going to test it, we're going to vet it, and we're going to associate a code signing certificate with that application in the MSI package. So we're going to use the various tools provided in Active Directory Certificate Services to create MSIs with code signing certificates embedded in them so that when an application is going through the install process, if that certificate is parsed and it is legal from a trusted publisher, then that application will effectively install even though it needs administrative privileges. If I enable this, any other app that does not have a certificate will not install. So we could, effect, in effect, have 40, 50 apps that we've approved and tested and certified with digital signatures. We will allow those to install and uninstall as needed by the user, but we will block all other apps. This is a viable way of creating a whitelist. Just understand, everybody, that it requires a certificate server in the background to really manage this. So the infrastructure tends to be a lot more. Now, we also have two more in here. The second one from the top, allow UI access applications. What does that mean, UI? User interface access. So think of an application that develops a user interface on access. Seems like it would be a remote desktop protocol or a PC anywhere or an application that you access another user interface somewhere else. Guys, this simply allows you to have UAC over a remote session through an application that creates a user interface like a remote control software, PC anywhere, remote assistance, remote desktop, desktop connect, any of the third party tools that are out there and so forth. It just allows UAC to run over those types of connections. Okay, so the UAC, understand, it runs and lives in the local security policy. Its job is to prevent unauthorized access to administrative locations, and it really is going to protect your system. Number one, in the Vista world, we were very, very upset at the frequency of the prompts. Hopefully now you understand how Microsoft has answered that criticism by giving us the slider as demonstrated in video one and also giving us the Windows binary attribute for the user and admin approval mode that I've just demonstrated for you here in the local security policy of this Windows 7 Ultimate machine. I hope you enjoyed this second portion of the video. If you did, please, guys, subscribe to my channel. Also, if you're interested, I have a Twitter account. I post on there every day, at Win7Trainer. I also have a blog. I detail a lot of certification information out there, a lot of great downloads as well. And that blog address is win7class.wordpress.com. I'm the Win7 Trainer. My name is Tim. Thanks for hanging out with me for the past 20 minutes. I hope you enjoyed it. And again, guys, do me a favor if you can. Please subscribe. Please look forward to a lot more videos coming your way. The next one I'm going to do is going to be on file and registry virtualization. Thank you.